Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. we got all kinds of people in the house. B. Squidward, Alpha Cronus, BD, the DBA, uh, Martin, see, I remembered Montreux 1981. I remembered your real name. And the way that I do that is I think of Chris Martin, I think it is, from Coldplay. Funny how that works out. SQL Dev, DBA, here in the shop as well. Good morning, party people. Evidently, on Fridays, y'all all pop in early for Office Hours. I One of these days, I need to get to a regular schedule, but I really like the freedom of just streaming whenever I uh, get uh, the time to work. SQL Dev DBA says, I'm waiting for the Elgato teleprompter. It's like out of stock everywhere. I know when I saw it come out, uh, and I, I don't know if I can turn my camera far enough to see it. Let's see. Oh, yeah, you can. Um, so there's the Elgato teleprompter up there. So this is my desk setup. This green light reflecting is because of my little check engine light in the background. But uh, So up over here, there's this teleprompter where I can see your Twitch chat when I'm streaming uh, stuff that uses the computer, like with when I'm working with the garage door open, so to speak, uh, streaming, like when I'm working on the first responder kit. Um, but as soon as that thing came out, I was like, oh, I want that really bad. And I ordered it before even the reviews started coming in. And I'm glad I did because it worked out really well. It really works well. Um, a little buggy on restart with uh, Max, but otherwise it's quite nice. Good morning, Michael J. Swart. Uh, WDD, the DBA says, is it me or is the check engine light uh, flashing SOS? Uh, it, You know, it's funny. Uh, with most of my cars, that answer would probably be yes. Uh, it feels like I have several collectors cars, not because I like collecting, but because odds are at any given time, one of them is going to work. I don't know which one it's going to be, but uh, odds are I'm going to be able to have at least one of them that's going to be drivable. We're also at the deep uh, winter part of Vegas, so it's typically below freezing in the mornings when I wake up. Um, and uh, so that makes it even more like there are cars I can't drive during the winter because either their tires are no good for we actually get snow. We got snow last night. Um, Tires are no good for going through certain parts of town where there's actually snow on the ground. We're going to drive up to Mount Charleston this weekend. Um, or else the, 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 we don't have a top for it, like the Porsche Speedster replica. Uh, the Speedster is sitting in the garage with the top uh, just like in a, in a part of the garage. I, I just took it off permanently. I don't even use it because uh, it's just so cold that I, I don't bother. The top doesn't hold that much wind in any, or hold that much air in anyway. So let's see, we got some interesting questions here. The top voted question from My Tea Got Cold is, is BCP dead for both exporting and importing? Me personally, I, I just have been lucky enough that I focus on engine performance tuning these days, so I never do any exporting or importing. That's not entirely true. Like just a few weeks ago, I had to import the Stack Overflow uh, exports, the data dump uh, from XML into Postgres. But the tool that I used was Richie Rump. I said to my developer, Richie Rump is my full-time developer, and I said, hey, Richie, here's what I want to do. You can use any tool that you want uh, and open source the results. Go. <laughs> um, because, of course, when you're importing, it's like half a terabyte worth of XML. I wouldn't trust any of my skills to get that right on the first try. So it was kind of funny how that worked. Bob the Lobster, good to see you. Next up, Paranoid DBA says, Hi Brent, do you think query tuners need to have a background in SQL development in order to be effective? Yes, absolutely. Because often tuning isn't just changing indexes. Tuning is often looking at a query and saying, what's a better way to accomplish these goals? And I'll give you the classic example is windowing functions. Every now and then I need to take somebody's query and I need to rewrite it with windowing functions in order to make it be more uh, uh, performant. And if I didn't know how to use windowing functions, then that would be a problem. And I never remember how to use windowing functions. I have to go back to the documentation every freaking time. Paranoid DBA continues and says, if so, what is the best book or course in order to get up to speed? By far, by a long shot, Itzik Ben-Gan's books. Itzik Ben-Gan, I-T-Z-I-K, Z-I-K. Z-I-K, uh, Ben Gon, fantastic, phenomenal author uh, who has all kinds of books available on Amazon. 
there are two that sound kind of similar. Oh, V-Last, thanks for the uh, subscription. Woo-hoo. Um, there are two books that sound kind of similar, T-SQL Fundamentals and uh, it's like T-SQL Querying. Um, go, uh, honestly, I think you'd be fine with either of them. They're both like 600 pages. Technically, one of them's supposed to go in front of the other, and I never remember which one it is until I go look at the table of contents, but that's Itzik Ben-Gan's books. Um, they're also, he's got a bunch of editions of them. If you want to save some money, you can actually, if you get the ability to get one of the old versions for like five bucks, sometimes Amazon's used booksellers have them for like two or three dollars even. Uh, it, then even the old versions are absolutely phenomenal. I read, I learn something every time I reread them. I have them on Kindle, so I just I reread them like once or twice a year and go, oh yeah, that's all the stuff I forgot. <laughs> uh, Renegade Larson, good to see you. Mailbox, it's an odd name, says, I'm currently a production DBA. I'm looking to increase my salary and career prospects without moving into consulting. Should I try to get a very big company because they might have more high-level positions? So there, there are natural limits to what you can do in a, a knowledge worker role. You can hit a point where you're just really good at what you do, but that's all that position is worth. So production DBA has a natural ceiling. What you're probably going to want to do is switch into some other kind of specialization. Now, you mentioned architect. Going from production DBA to architect can be kind of a leap. Things that I might consider transitioning to in the meantime might be development DBA, someone who focuses more on uh, performance tuning or business intelligence work might be easier for you to get into that kind of work. With an architect, people are or companies are usually looking for folks with an experience in building solutions, and production DBAs often have experience keeping the lights on, but not necessarily building solutions. So you ask, should you try to get on at a very big company? Generally, the larger that you go into, the more people are on the same team. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy for you to switch teams. Because if a company has, say, a big architecture team already, they may already have a pipeline of people uh, who are ready to advance into that role. So to me, it's less about the size of the company. It's more about talking to the hiring managers and saying, OK, look, here's what my career path, I want it to look like in the next three, four years. Is this something that makes sense at this company or no? Um, you're in a really good position if you currently have a job, because that's when you want to be really tough and picky about those positions. Whereas once you get laid off or once you get let go from a company, you tend to lower your standards quickly uh, just in order to get a job. And in that case, when you're lowering your standards, you're going to have a really hard time saying, well, this is what I want my career to look like over the next three or four years. Does this fit well for you? Because you're kind of giving them an excuse to rule you out. So just be careful with that. Next up, Bob the Lobster says, Good day, Brent. Have you seen any interesting forks of the first responder kit? Bob, this is such a good question. I haven't looked. But I don't know how to look. Because... There have been GitHub projects that I've looked at that have died, and I've said, oh my god, it shows that there's like 15 forks of this project. I want to go find the most active fork, and I haven't been able to figure out how to do that in GitHub. So if one of you knows how to see, if you're looking at a GitHub project, and there's a, there's a little thing for forks, how do you see the most active forks for a project? That's what I'd be interested in. Because otherwise, the number of forks is huge. If I go look at the first responder kit, it's kind of staggering. There are 950 forks of the first responder kit. And while I can just go through and see a list, it doesn't necessarily show me which ones are the most active, and that's the piece that I would really want to see. 
Next up, Jan says, let's imagine for a minute a very unlikely scenario uh, where users or devs blame the DBA for an app performance issue without any proof. What would you share with them to prove that the DB is working fine? What I what I always would say is, oh, you, so you think there's a database problem? Show me your proof. Show me what, what you think is going on with the database uh, that makes you think it's slow. Because often the server's okay, the, like the database server's okay, but their part of the thing that they're relying on is not okay. Like they have a query where they're not happy with performance. They're like, when I click here in the application, uh, then all of a sudden things respond really slowly. Then that way I can go look to see, okay, what is it that the application is doing in that part of the app? Uh, and then find out what we can do to make that part go faster. Um, the other thing, if you just if they say, well, it just seems like everything's slow, then you can go look at wait stats is one place to go look. The other place that I like to go look is uh, query duration. Query duration, you can run SP Blitz Cache sorted by either duration or average duration, and those will show you the queries that are taking the longest time overall or the queries that are taking individually the longest time when they run. Uh, uh, over in uh, chat, SQL Dev DBA says SP Quickie Store is getting really good. I, I like that, but the problem with that to solve this question is that it doesn't show the queries that don't make it into Query Store. And I find that happens a lot with uh, unparameterized queries, for example. Seems to be a rampant problem out there. Whereas SP Blitz Cache sorted by average duration will show you even the one-off queries, which is kind of nice. Next up, Mailbox asks, Hey Brent, are you planning on releasing a Fundamentals or Mastering class on stored procedures? I don't pre-release anything because what I've had several times over the last several years is I've started down the road of building a course and then put the car into reverse and said, Nope, I'm not writing that. Um, Fundamentals of Stored Procedures was one of those. I wrote a good chunk of a Fundamentals of Stored Procedures class only to find that I didn't, I wasn't really at a point where I wanted to give that class. I got half of it already written. There may come a point where I go out and publish that kind of thing. Maybe I do it as like a pre-release version of a course, or uh, maybe I just only give it to people who have bundles. Uh, but I tend to not pre-release now because of that exact problem. And he uh, follows up with, uh, what hotel do you recommend in Vegas? On the Strip, Cosmo. Cosmo is absolutely fantastic. It's the best uh, deal for luxury and kind of a bargain. If you want luxury and really nice, it's hard to beat the Wynn. Wynn has kind of an amazing reputation on the Strip for like the luxurious hotel. If you just want a deal, Fountain Blue. Fountain Blue's the newest hotel. Uh, they're doing huge sales on rooms because they can't fill it up just yet. Uh, but there's no shopping in there. There's a limited amount of restaurants. So uh, you kind of got to be careful there. Michael J. Swartz is slightly more, the queries by average by duration or, or asking to show people the part of the apps is slightly more diplomatic than show me proof. Um, or is to say instead, interesting, how do you know that? Next up, Pizzarama says, Hi Brent, when we update our customers, we drop and recreate all procedures and triggers. Uh, Pizzarama, you've asked that question several times. This time, uh, blame on me for not reading it. Pizzarama, I swear to God, if you ask that question one more time, I'm going to build a feature. Well, Richie Rump is going to build a feature into... Actually, I can block you! Oh, but not that I've already, after I've shown the question. Once I've shown the question, I can't block you. I'll remember that for next time, and I'll just block you. Uh, Ricardo says, what is a cheap cloud-based SQL Server for demos? We use Chromebooks onto Windows Server. We use Chromebooks onto Windows servers for work. I don't even want to know what you're meaning there. Uh, and says this isn't for work. So in terms of pure SQL Server, there's no concept of a development edition SQL Server up in the cloud. Or there's there's is this server for dev test, and they'll give you some slightly cheaper hardware, less reliability. But it's not like a, a free development edition is for uh, out in the wild. 
So what I would start with is if you want to use Amazon Light Sale, Light Sale are really cheap VMs. Uh, and then on there, you could put SQL Express Edition. And then at least Express Edition works for one, gigab or one gigabyte worth of RAM, one CPU, and up to, I forget if it's 10 gigs of data or 50 gigs of data. But that, that's about as cheap as it gets for real SQL Server. Uh, next up, Haida asks, for SQL connection strings, what are the top app naming conventions you've seen in the wild? I've never seen them, so you got me on that one. No clue. Rob says, hi, Brent. I can't seem to find guidance for MaxDOP on a SQL instance with multiple databases. For example, if I've got 10 databases and four cores, if MaxDOP is set to four, can one query potentially block all others from CPU time? Well, Rob, let's rewind that a little. What if you only had one database? You still run multiple queries at the same time, even in just one database, right? The number of databases isn't really a factor as much as the number of simultaneous queries and right about now you're slapping yourself in the head and you're realizing that, oh God, the problem is so much worse than you thought. Welcome to database administration. So can one out of control query monopolize the SQL server? Yes, in the sense that it'll use a lot of CPU, but not in the sense that it'll use all of it. SQL server has this really cool thing called cooperative multitasking. And I explain how that works in my mastering SQL server, mastering SQL tuning class, mastering server tuning class in the CPU module and in the SOS in the uh, um, uh, thread pool module. So if you're in the mastering server tuning classes, check those out. Next up, Pete says, good morning. I have an execution plan uh, where everything works real fast in a hurry, except for two places and two operators. What should I do? Really, the, the best thing to do here is to paste the execution plan over at pastetheplan.com. Pastetheplan.com is a site we built where you can copy paste execution plans into there and then you can share it with other people on the internet to get advice on your specific query. You can take that link and then paste it on, say, dba.stackexchange.com, stackoverflow.com, sqlserverCentral.com's forums, and then get inputs from other people. Because, of course, I'm less concerned about the operators. I'm more concerned about what the query's doing overall and how I can fix that. Surly Dev says cooperative multitasking sounds like something teammates should be good at doing. In my experience, teammates are rarely good at anything. That's not true. It just was a fun joke to make. Stu says, do you pick your intro music songs or are they randomly selected? It's kind of a bit of both. I use Pretzel. I use a music app called Pretzel that's for streamers. Um, and then when you're not around, I go through and look at those or I play uh, uh, the electro upbeat electronic dance music uh, genre. And then I just like songs out of there and I have a playlist that's automatically created with my liked songs. Then those play randomly leading up to the stream and after the stream. Uh, first tag you, or, uh, go head up or over at the URL up over at the, t or for a tag you up the URL up at the top right there on where to ask questions. Next up, Owl Kitty says, how would you compare the SQL community to the Postgres community? That's a great question. The Postgres community loves mailing lists. The SQL Server community tends to like forums. So they're two different ways of interacting. There are minor communities for both on Discord, but it's really this old school versus new school mentality. The Postgres community is very, very old school with things like mailing lists. The SQL Server community is much more newer school with things like SQL help hashtags, Discord, uh, Slack communities, and so forth. 
Um, Another way that it pops up is with Postgres, uh, the conferences tend to be at colleges, not just because they're places that are good to host conferences, but because they tend to have a lot of academic people there, that there are a lot of college students working on the Postgres engine, uh, doctoral students, uh, professors that work on the Postgres engine. Um, for example, I just registered for pgconf.dev, which is the development conference for people who build, uh, build both Postgres and who build the communities around Postgres. Um, and that's also at a college for those same reasons. There's, a, there's even academic rates. Um, SQL Dev DBA says, thank you for that clarification. Every time I see a question on Reddit for the Postgres or Oracle communities, I'm like, what community? Yeah, the mentality is just so totally different in terms of where the places gather. Um, and that was also part of why when I started building Smart Postgres, I made the conscious decision that I am going to focus on building an online community that's more web 2.0 instead of mailing list type people. Because I think that modern developers are much more uh, accustomed to being on web communities, uh, to being on Discord, being on TikTok, things like that, uh, as opposed to the existing uh, uh, mailing list community is a very different kind of audience. Mailbox says, how do I watch your streams live? How do people know when you're going to stream? I just stream whenever it's convenient for me. I don't have a published schedule. It's just whenever I have the time. To see my streams live, go over to twitch.tv slash Brent Ozar, and you can subscribe to my, uh, or follow my feed over there, and then that way you get emails uh, whenever I'm about, or whenever I start going live. Next up, Peter says, which SQL product is best for implementing query execution chargebacks to each customer in a multi-tenant cloud environment? And he lists a few different database platforms. So for me, if you can separate each customer into its own database, then I love Azure SQL DB and uh, uh, Amazon RDS. In particular, Azure SQL DB. I should have just said Azure SQL DB, because then you can do separate bills for each of those. If a customer wants more horsepower, you can upgrade their individual DB and charge them back directly for that. Via Once you start piling everybody onto the same VMs or onto products like managed instances uh, that support multiple databases on the same server, it's extremely hard to do chargebacks accurately there. Next up, Najiba says, in canned SQL Server, what is, do you have SQL Server in the can? You should probably let them out. What is the best way to determine which apps are writing to a given table? Auditing. Auditing for me would be the best way to do it because you can't use execution plans. You can't really use query store because execution plans are reused across no matter which application calls them. So SQL Server doesn't bother tracking that in a historical sense. Auditing will give you that information. Just be careful to only turn it on for the specific tables that you need to have this learning exercise. You only turn it on when you need that data and turn it off as quickly as you can afterwards. Because auditing has an overhead, just like anything has an overhead. And you don't want to slow down your SQL Server unless you're going to gain something meaningful in a change for that. <laughs> Solutions Group Unlimited says over in the chat, rename the table and see who yells. <laughs> in, in on a related note, you could uh, deny permissions on a table if you really wanted to. You could deny permissions on a table to everyone and then grant it for specific logins uh, and you know gradually turn that granting back out. B Squidward says, I love using extended events uh, for finding that info. I, I would be fine with extended events too as well. That's also a good solution to that problem. Next up, let's see what Mr. Bean has to ask. Mr. Bean says, I found a strange scenario where we paste the SSMS message pane stats into statistics parser, and after parsing it, it shows too high of an elapsed time. Um, Mr. Bean, that's a known issue in some SQL Server versions when you turn on set statistics time and I.O. on and you pull the actual execution plan that you'll get duplicates of messages inside of there. Surly Dev says Richard Campbell uh, says that he whenever he got lonely at work, he would turn a server off. That's good. I like that. That's pretty funny. 
Uh, next up, Demetrius says, I'm currently using Optimize for ad hoc. Can this hide high memory grant single use queries? Yes. If so, does monitoring software overcome this blind spot? Let's rewind and say, why did you turn that switch on? I turned this switch on. Now I can't see stuff. What else should I do? You should stop there. You should turn that switch back off. Every time I turn more switches, it just keeps seeming to have more problems. I, got, I can't figure out what the problem is. The problem is you. Turn switches on in order to solve problems. But Demetrius, you turned on a switch that causes problems. And now you know. Next up, Bob the Lobster says, Hello again, Brent. I read that the first responder kit isn't supported in Azure SQL DB. Do you know people who maintain at least some of your scripts on Azure SQL DB, and how do they do it? No. No. They can't all be long answers. No. Next up, Kirk says, do you have a preferred method for tracking changes in a table that an app can then go read, like look at the history of an item? I'm aware of the options in the top voted answer here. Well, that if you're aware of the answers, what are you asking me for? All right, let's go copy paste this URL out. This is a good example of something that I never really want to do. Uh, so this thing has a bunch of answers inside it. Option one. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, but not sins. Welcome, Johnny, Johnny. I'm going to move that. Oh, I can't move that down. Let me disconnect that. Let me unlock. How do I move this down? Just move. I'll just move this piece down. That should do it. Um, uh, so let's see here. So inside that web page, it has a column called is history and a log table. Oh, wow, that's a five year old question. Um, so because it's a five year old question, it doesn't have the thing that I would use uh, is I would use uh, uh, temporal tables. Temporal tables are perfect for this kind of thing. Go check out temporal tables. Um, and there are a bunch of presentations on it. I want to say Vicki Harp has a video on YouTube about it. Uh, so if you can search, if you want a video, search for Vicki Harp and then temporal tables. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, check out the up at the top uh, le or top right over there. Uh, there's the URL to go post questions there. Next up, we have Colonel Kirk Saunders, who says, do you have any uh, functions, keywords, tricks, or tips that you've learned recently that you find fun or cool or useful? Well, I'll tell you what, usually I just put those on the blog, right? That's what I have a blog for. But I'll tell you one that I haven't blogged about and I, I think about a lot. You hear all the time people like, chat GPT is going to take jobs. No, you know what chat GPT does? Is it creates jobs that never could have been real jobs before because everyone who watches this can afford to hire chat gpt as their junior so what i do and the only way that i could get into this habit was i have a monitor and up on that monitor i have chat gpt at all times i don't have a tab in my browser for it i have chat gpt up there because that forces me as a reminder as i'm working on any task over here i'll go oh wait a minute could i copy paste this request over directly into chat gpt and just see what it comes out with about half the time it's garbage but the other half the time, I can copy paste its output and it can get me 50% of the way there quickly. So I look at it as a junior who sits next to me and I can just continually check and say, hey, do, do you know how to do this? Most of the time they go, no, or their work is incompetent. But sometimes it makes me a little more productive. I would recommend that everybody keep a window open with chat GPT-4, well, or whatever the newest version is as of the time that uh, uh, you uh, uh, are watching this, and put your requests inside there. Now, Solutions Group Unlimited says chat GPT's quality depends on exactly how you word how you word the question. I agree, and I think that having chat GPT open forces you to learn better about prompting and I, I, I do that particularly in my own life. I'm going to 
and I'm not going to put it in there because I'd have to go do some clicking. But I even have a prompt that I use in ChatGPT that says, you are, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little, you are an experienced, cheerful, helpful SQL Server developer using SQL Server 2019. Given this table structure, and I copy paste in the table structure, uh, how would you accomplish blank? Include helpful resource links that are relevant to the question. Um, and, and also I say, like, keep it very concise. You know, don't be wordy, don't use flowery language. Uh, and then that the idea there is that I think of it as a, a coworker who sits next to me. How do I design the best coworker? And that seems to work out pretty well for my, uh, my own purposes. <laughs> SQL DBA says, SQL Dev DBA says, mid journey meme generators. Surly so Dev says, it may just give you a solution you hadn't considered. The, the thing that I really like about it, and I actually have a blog post coming about this on one of the query exercises homeworks, is it gives me gotchas that I wouldn't have considered. For example, there was one where I was using a date part for day of week, and I wanted a list of days of weeks, and they're like, hey, you know, it gives me the solution. He says, hey, also just, I think of him as a guy, so I say he. Uh, hey, just so you know, the day of week can depend on whatever people set set date first in their uh, uh, connection or in their uh, session options. And I was like, what? You know, I never thought of that. So that's kind of cool. Uh, B, Squid, B Squidward says with GP, chat GPT-4, you can create your own semi-custom model and also custom instructions, and that's super useful. One thing I've, I've been watching is RAGS, and I forget what RAG stands for, uh, but it has to do with training additional information into chat GPT or your own uh, language model, uh, you know, Mistral or whatever one you want to use, and you can add in additional training permanently. I love that for databases because I want to not have to put in every time I ask the question, I'm using this version of SQL Server, I have these tables in place, you know, it's at these stored procedures. It's really nice to train it on that ahead of time. Now, with Stack Overflow, I don't really have to worry about that because it was also trained on enough open source material that it includes the Stack Overflow database and it has some shortcuts there, which is kind of cool. Uh, Amorty, check out uh, uh, the URL up there on the top of the screen there. Um, Nazarin says, what, or Nazanin says, who is the Brentos are of Microsoft Fabric? Um, oh man, I'm not going to remember the guy's name. Um, dag nabbit, there's a European guy who's been blogging a lot about it. Um, the other people that I would put, point you towards are is Edward or Eugene Meidinger. Uh, not that he wrote a lot about it, but it has some stuff about it, Eugene Meidinger. And if you go to YouTube, um, Guy in a Cube, Guy, search for uh, Guy in a Cube on YouTube, and they work for Microsoft, and they also have YouTube channels, uh, or a YouTube channel that focuses on Power BI type stuff. They've started getting into Microsoft Fabric as well. Let's see here. Next up, uh, uh, Alexi, we've already uh, answered that one in a previous webcast, so I'll close that. Um, Alexi has another question in there. Alexi says, uh, is it possible to identify which query is hitting which CPU core? Yes. Um, now, this is one of those times where I can exercise SQL Server knowledge that I comes in almost never handy, never comes in handy. SysDMOS schedulers gets you the CPS score, that, or CPU uh, cores. That's SysDMOS schedulers. Then you're going to have a worker threads DMV that tells you which tasks are running on which cores. Then you're going to have to join that to requests and tasks, which will tell you uh, which queries from which sessions are running on which cores. A place to get yourself a head start would be to go look at SP Who is Active. SP Who is Active is an open source query. <coughs> oh, goodness, from um, Adam Mechanic and Eric Darling. You're going to pop that open and you're going to recoil in horror because it's super complex. Um, but if you want a, a query to start you down that road, that would be the place to go. 
All right, so there's all the questions that we have there in Poll Gab. We've been going for like half an hour there. Now I suppose it's time for me to get back to work and do my real job. Uh, so I will go hop in back into uh, telling Chat GPT to do work for me, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios, folks.